Do you know how to recognize someone's gait? Well, I recognized the woman who walked into the hotel. She walked and held herself just like my wife, Karen. It was dark, just lights from the hotel. You couldn't see anything. But the way she held herself made me think it was her. It couldn't be her because she was home. I had talked to her last night on the phone, and she hadn't told me she was going anywhere. And this hotel was miles away from our house. I was completely baffled. The guy she was with looked like Darren. He was our supervisor. We both worked at the same driving school. That can't be right. It can't be? Something was wrong here. I had just pulled into the parking lot at the hotel I was staying at tonight. There had been a change in the training program schedule, and I had changed hotels at the last minute. This was easy since we had an arrangement with this hotel chain. I tried calling home earlier and got an answering machine. Karen's cell phone went straight to the post office. I called the office and tried calling Darren. I didn't get all the messages because the office called me back. There aren't many cell phone signals in the Salisbury Plain area, but that's okay, I just kept going. I stopped the car, ran up to the hotel entrance, and looked out from behind the door. It was my wife and my boss. The worst part was that they both had small suitcases, and he had his arm around her waist, which was much more familiar than a working relationship. What the hell was going on? They looked very familiar with each other. It definitely looked like they were having an affair. I sat down heavily on the hotel steps and threw up. I started breathing really deep. What the hell was going on and what was I supposed to do now? It actually dispelled a lot of the doubts I had had over the past couple months. Everything was now clear. A change in program, a change in schedule, a change in my job. I needed time to sit down and think. I went back and parked the car properly. A car with the L license plates of a driving instructor should be driven and parked responsibly. I snuck back and made sure the front desk was empty, then walked up to the counter and booked a room. I have stayed here several times. Kelly, the assistant manager, was on duty at the front desk and we got along well. A couple of months ago, I did her a favor. We chatted about the weather and stuff, then I asked who the previous couple who had booked the accommodation were. I told her they looked familiar. She told me it was Mr. and Mrs. Smith. She tilted her head slightly and said Smith, which showed she didn't believe them. I hope they're not around me. It looks like they're going to be noisy tonight. Oh, no, she said. You're in 214. They're in 236, far down the hall. So how often did they stay here? I asked. Is there something going on here? Kelly asked. Maybe. That sounds like my boss, but it's not his wife. I just want to get my facts straight before I say anything. Don't worry, I won't mention the hotel or where I got my information from. I won't mention that it was my wife he was with. Kelly did something on the computer and said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but they were here three months ago for a big symposium or something. They had separate rooms then. They've been back twice since then. I tracked it down because he uses the same credit card. I just had to check the last four numbers. It's a company credit card. I needed time to think. So I went to the bar and bought a pint of beer, something I don't usually do when I go in the morning. I took it to my room. I need to think about how we got to this point. I think a little backstory might be needed here. The driving school I work at was based in Salisbury. We had a contract to train young recruits to drive cars, buses, and trucks. Until five months ago, I was still teaching around Salisbury, covering the garrison towns of Tidworth, Bulford, and Larkhill, north of Salisbury. Other lads looked after other places north and west of the plain. Cyril looked after Lynham in the north. Graham looked after the neighborhood of Warminster. It was a brilliant job, meeting young people and seeing them grow up in the army system, as I did. Adolescence is being replaced by adulthood. These locations are well scattered around the edge of the Salisbury Plain training area, which is pretty hard to traverse unless you have a main battle tank or large truck. Cyril ended his career five months ago, and Graham fell down a ladder a couple of months ago, incapacitating himself for several months, causing a hole in the north end of the training ground. I was asked to take responsibility for the North training area for a few months until they could find a replacement, and Graham recovered from his fall. There were other driving instructors, but most were young with kids and not ex-military. You could make a better connection if you had a common background and the training could go much better. So I just pulled myself together and carried on. 
It's not forever, Darren told me. Karen worked in our driving school offices, arranging appointments, payment, bookkeeping, and instructor expenses. This included me, so I was always very careful to make sure I was below the limit. It's not good to put your wife in a position where she has to berate you for spending too much money. When I looked at our bank account each month to see how much she spent, I was struck by the irony each time. Darren wasn't a handsome sex god. He was a little plain and a little overweight. What were they both doing here? Or as I thought about it, if it was agreed between the two of them, I'd leave and they could have an affair. I have to find out. I need proof to give to Darren's wife, Sheila. She worked in our Salisbury office too, but she didn't come in as often. I had to defend my work. The kids were still at university. I thought about our life together. Our sex life had always been good. Before the kids came along, we had tried just about everything. Money was tight. It took us months to save up for her first pair of thigh-high boots. She still has them, they still fit, and she still wears them. What we liked, we did again. What we didn't like, we didn't do again. As you might expect, things got a little worse when the kids came along. But after they went to college, things went back on track, except for the last few months when I was looking after the North Sector. I was away three days a week and nervous when I got home on Friday. So why was she here with Darren? I came up with a plan. It wasn't a clear plan. It would depend on their responses. It was more of a set of guidelines to counter the cheaters. I went downstairs to get some dinner, though I wasn't particularly hungry. I went down early and had a chat with the maitre d'. I asked him where Mr. and Mrs. Smith would be seated because I didn't want to be in front of them. I'd been to this restaurant several times and got along with the staff. Often, the maitre d' would ask me to choose where I would sit. He indicated where Mr. and Mrs. Smith would sit. I chose where I could watch them, but hopefully not be seen. The maitre d' told me they'd be in at seven. I set up my laptop so it looked like I was working. They walked in, he put his arm around her waist, which really annoyed me. They sat down, I waited for them to order and called the maitre d'. I asked him to deliver a bottle of Moselle wine at my expense. I knew it was on the wine list, and I knew it was one of her favorite wines. I asked him not to tell them where it came from. As I looked around the room watching it being delivered, it seemed to cause real consternation, especially when the maitre d' didn't tell them where the wine came from. For a while, they just sat and chatted. However, there was quite a bit of hand-touching, smiling, and giggling, mostly from Darren. It wasn't a business meeting. They can't force it on me. The dress she wore was stunning. I had never seen it before, and certainly not the dress she wore for me. Karen continued to look at the bottle of wine and then out into the hall. I realized something was bothering her. That was a good sign. The time I usually called her at 7, 30.45 p.m. was approaching. I went out to the hotel lobby and called her on her cell phone. I could see her from where I was. I saw her take her cell phone out of her purse, I think she said. I have to take this, it's John. She took the phone and walked into the foyer where no background music could be heard. I plugged in my headphones and turned on the recording. I should be able to talk to her and record at the same time. It's a wonderful invention such phones are. At the time, I noticed some smart young man walking around the hotel filming on his phone. I noticed him because he kept getting in the way so I couldn't see Karen. Hello, darling, I said. Just a quick call. There was a change of plan. I called the office, but they told me you went home early anyway. How is your day going? Are you working too hard? It sounds very quiet. Don't you have the TV on? I've got the TV muted. It's just on. You know how it is in the house. There's always something to do, even if you're not here, my dear. You sound funny. Do you talk on a regular phone? Yes, but I use headphones so I can take video and talk to you at the same time. I didn't know you could do that. What are you recording? Some guy is walking around the hotel and videotaping it, so I'm videotaping it. She looked around and saw the guy filming on his phone walk into the restaurant. Would she put two and two together and come up with four? She had a questioning look on her face. I immediately moved on. Are you sure you're home? The noise in the background isn't like when we're talking on the landline? Of course it's your phone. She looked a little flustered. I tried to call you on the landline. You didn't pick up. I was quiet for a moment. I must have been in the garden. I'm sorry I missed it. It's not a big deal. 
Obviously, there is so much to do at this time of year. Don't overdo it by doing too much, I said. She looked a little taken aback by the F word, which I don't normally use. Listen, I was going to tell you about the change of plan, but something just came up. Can I call you later? Sure, honey. Just don't leave it too late if I end up in bed. It's still early. Do you have anything interesting in bed? Maybe another man? I tried to sound serious. I think it came out that way. Oh, no, honey, you are the only man for me. No one else can compare to you. So how do you know? I thought I was your first. Are you doing something to compare? I'll try to be a little more lighthearted this time. I could see her from where I was standing. She was starting to get nervous and maybe even a little wobbly. Okay, time for you to get back to comparing. I laughed, hitting the hang-up button. She looked startled, like she was waiting for a goodbye, I love you, but nothing came. She held the phone in front of her and just stared at it. While she was doing that, she looked away from me. That wasn't part of the plan. I took the opportunity to walk up behind her and gently pat her shoulder. She turned, looked at me, odd, and collapsed to the floor. It was unexpected. It was hard, but I went to the front desk to tell them the lady had fainted. I told them I wasn't going to touch her as I didn't want to be accused of harassing a woman. However, one of the waiters saw her fall and rushed over to her. He picked her up and brought her back to the table with Darren. While I was at the front desk, I asked who the guy was who was walking around taking videos. I was told he was an influencer. I had to ask what an influencer was and was told it was a person who records things, does reviews, and puts them on YouTube. They did this in hopes of getting a free night's lodging. It didn't work here, they had to pay for a room, but they got a free meal. Pretty damn stupid idea if you ask me. Then I realized that the phones were still plugged in, so I could hear everything that was being said. I made sure I was still recording. I must have missed the hang-up button and hit the mute button in a hurry. I think Karen recovered after the waiter took her back to her table. I stealthily walked back to my table. I could see them, but they were too focused on their problem to look around for me. John's here, Darren, John's here. No way, he's in Lynham. I saw him, he patted me on the shoulder. One second I was on the phone to him and the next he was there. She nearly cried. He can't find out about us, it would kill him. Wait, why would he do that and leave? Damn it, it would kill us, he can't find out about us. He was quiet for a moment. If he finds out, Sheila finds out, and my marriage goes down too, I'll call him, Darren said, picking up the phone. If looks could kill, Darren would be dead right now. You should have thought of that when you started this, Karen reminded him. But he'll never know about it. Who sent us that bottle of wine? Someone who knows Schwartz cats is a favorite of mine. She fell silent. Is there something wrong here? Look. If he's here, we say it's a business meeting. Really, you shouldn't be so stupid to dress like that for a business meeting at eight o'clock at night. And I just told him I was home. Okay, we'll say it's just the first time and it doesn't mean anything. We just got carried away. He's not stupid enough to believe that. Look, it was only a couple times. We can't blame it on that. A couple times. At least three in this hotel since that symposium where you blackmailed me. Yeah, but that's what you wanted. Hell no, you drugged me and took pictures of me. Ain't yeah, but you kept coming back without blackmailing me. Well, you showed me pictures of John and that secretary. What's her name? Kelly, I had to bite my tongue at reception. You threatened to fire me and tell John I came to you and in a moment of weakness you gave in. Anyway, it was a little fun to dispel the boredom while he was gone. She said, Never mind that he's going to kill us anyway, damn it. But you liked it, he said. It was something to do. He's gone three nights a week and is so tired when he gets home on Friday that I have to wait until Saturday before I get anything. You were just something to fill the time with. You're not really that good. You're too selfish. But you seem to enjoy it. If I have to do it, I might enjoy it. And with a little practice, you could become as good as John. That's when I decided to take some action because we were often alone with young women taking lessons. To back up the DVR recordings, all the instructors had pens that were voice recorders. I took mine, stood up, and headed over to their table. I heard Darren say, I'll call him again. I hung up, but my phone was still recording. 
He must have hit the redial button because I was halfway to their table when my phone rang loudly and everyone looked at me, including Darren and Karen. She fainted for a few seconds and Darren just said, oh shit. I sat down across from them. I was noticed by everyone in the restaurant. I waited a few seconds for Karen to regain consciousness and then I said, killing you would be getting off too easy. It would hurt a lot more. John, it's not what it looks like, Darren said. So what the hell is this? It's a celebration of the new contract we just got. I looked at Karen. She was looking at Darren with an incredulous expression on her face as if to say, what the hell are you talking about? Okay then to say I believe you, which I don't by the way. What the hell are you doing here away from Salisbury with an office slut instead of your wife? This caused Karen to throw a serious angry look at me. I looked straight at her and said, don't say a bloody word. Looking back at Darren, I said, so what kind of contract is this? Then enlighten me. It's even more bullshit that I'm away from home so you can fuck my wife. His face went pale. Karen sat back and looked very depressed. As hard as I tried, I couldn't stay calm. All the frustration I had been thinking about for the last couple hours was spilling out. I said in a loud voice, so you arrange for me to be gone three nights a week and work so damn hard that I'm exhausted so you can move in and sleep with my wife while I'm gone. You organized all this just so you could deal with my wife. Now I've raised my voice a little. You evil, dirty bastard, just wait until Sheila hears all about it. At that moment, I see the maitre d' rush over to our table. In a muffled but direct voice, he said, Sir, you are a valued customer of this establishment. Could you please refrain from swearing and keep the noise down? I looked at him and said, Sorry, Paul, you are quite right, but I think some of your customers enjoy the entertainment. As I looked at the maitre d', I noticed that the influencer was videotaping everything that was going on. I looked back at the maitre d' and said, you can call it husband confronts wife and lover in a hotel. No better make it husband confronts wife and lover in a restaurant. Let's keep the hotel away from that. I think they'll appreciate it. Turning to the maitre d', I said again, I'll have what they have and I'll put it on his tab. The company pays anyway. It's not out of his pocket, in fact. Have it for yourself. To me, my appetite seemed to have returned. The Aberdeen Angus filet was fantastic. I casually paid for it myself. It was about double what we were given for the meal. Karen opened her mouth to say something, probably about the expense. I just threw her a stern Paddington look and she shut up. I picked up my phone and took a picture of Darren and Karen together. I already had plenty, but that was part of the threat. Karen raised her hand like a nervous little schoolgirl asking if she could speak. I looked at her and nodded. She looked at Darren and said, you told me that John asked you for an assignment up north. Isn't that true? Looking at me, she said, you asked for that? Absolutely not. Hell no. Why would I get out of bed to go to bed in several strange beds throughout the year? I turned my phone around and showed them both a picture I had just taken of them sitting pretty close together in a hotel restaurant. Okay, tell me the fucking truth or that picture goes straight to Sheila right now and you can end your marriage. What about the picture I saw of you walking into a room with your secretary, Kelly, at 10.45 p.m.? Why would she walk into a room at that time of night unless it was something illegal? Show me the pictures. I saw the sneaky way he was trying to get into my wife's pants. I was starting to feel a little forgiveness for her, but only a little bit. She looked at Darren. Give me your phone and unlock it or John will send the pictures to Sheila. He did as he was told. She flipped through some pictures and turned the phone around, which showed me. I took the phone from her and swiped some more pictures. I saw what he had done. I handed it back to her and said, If you look over here, you'll see that he's taking a picture of a picture, but with a different time stamp to make it look like it's 1045. Look at the window in the background. It's never daylight at 1045 p.m. She came back with it. Could it be the lights in the parking lot? If it was, the shadows would be on the ceiling, not the floor. Shit, that's all I heard. I asked a passing waiter if he would be so kind as to bring me a flyer from the front desk advertising the hotel. The table was very quiet until he returned. I unfolded the flyer and showed a picture of Kelly leading me to my room. 
The photo was for an ad campaign, and I was being asked to help. Oh, shit. Here we go again. They asked if they could take a picture of me because I looked normal, not like a model. Kelly was just showing me my room. It wasn't even my room. In fact, it wasn't even a bedroom. It was an office. Karen's face took on a questioning expression. She turned away from Darren. I could see the gears turning in her head. She looked at Darren and said loudly, So let me understand this. You sent my husband away. You told me he asked for this, even though he didn't. You faked pictures that he was having an affair, drugged me, did his own thing to me, blackmailed me by threatening my marriage and my job. I could see it took her a few minutes to come up with what took me a couple hours. I'm surprised the slap she gave him didn't break his jaw. The entire restaurant, including Mr. Influencer, looked at us, and there was dead silence. Mr. Influencer was still shooting the video. She was about to take another swing at him, and I was tempted to let her do it until I saw the maitre d' heading our way. I grabbed her arm and said, calm down or we'll get kicked out and I'm not done yet. Seeing this, the maitre d' departed. Although the restaurant was very quiet, everyone was furtively looking at us, waiting for the next event. They probably hadn't had this much fun in years. Oh, it gets worse, I said. I might have some of this stuff a little weird, but there you go. With those words, I reached out and took Darren's half-full glass of wine and took a sip. Mmm, that's great, you won't need it. I like Schwa's cats too, I said, placing the glass in front of me. At this time, the maitre d' brought me a steak, placed it in front of me, and said in a loud whisper, Keep it down or I'll throw you all out. I took the hint. If I got kicked out of the hotel, it wouldn't help me at all. I was the most aggressive, so it was probably my fault. I looked at him and said, Sorry, Paul. I'll behave better when I have dinner. I think he was happy I knew his name. Let's start with what I think is the beginning. Cyril retired and Graham fell down the stairs. That gave you the opportunity to send me to the northern sector, keeping me away from home for at least two days, and it turned out to be closer to three. You knew I wouldn't let the company or the client down. You used that to your advantage. You promised me you'd recruit new people to replace me. Then you'd get a better handle on the workload. I looked at Karen and asked, How many interviews has he done in the last five months to replace Cyril? I don't know of any, but he told me you're happy with it and you're happy with the extra money. Money doesn't make up for time away from home. I took a full sip of wine. It gave me time to think. Had he advertised at all? Not that I'd seen one. Second, he's inviting you to a symposium on driving simulators. You don't think his wife, who owns the company, would be a better person to make those decisions than someone doing clerical work, do you? But she was sick, so she couldn't go and the room was already booked. All he had to do was get an extra room. Do you know why she was sick? I asked. She had an allergic reaction. She has a nut intolerance. How easy it would have been for him to give her some nuts and make her sick. Not to say he did, but given what he did for you, I wouldn't put it past him. You poisoned your wife, you sick bastard. Throughout this denunciation, he looked down at his knees, but this time he raised his head and said, I wouldn't do that to Sheila. I love her. Karen looked at him and said, Then why did you sleep with me? With those words, she got up, walked over, and sat down next to me. She looked at me and said, I'm really, really sorry. Can we talk about this? I ate another bite of steak, looked at her, and said, Later. Maybe we'll see. I had already pretty much decided what I was going to do. Okay, tell me about the symposium and the blackmail. I only got what I just overheard. Karen explained to me that although she had her own room, she had woken up in Darren's bed naked with a massive hangover. She assumed she had had too much to drink, and he put her to bed in his room because he was a gentleman. She thought no more of it. The following Monday, he took her out for coffee during lunch and then showed her pictures of her doing pranks on him. He told her that if she didn't keep it up, he would fire her fire me and blame her for coming on to him, and he was weak. He would put himself at his wife's mercy. She had always forgiven him his mistakes because she loved him and would almost certainly forgive him if he could lay the blame on Karen. I was angry, but I needed to get this over with, so I tried to stay calm. I leaned over the table, grabbed his hand, and pulled it to the table. I placed the steak knife point down on the back of his palm. 
So you drugged my wife and then raped her, you evil bastard. He was in a panic. He looked at me and said, no, 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 I didn't rape her. What's the point of having someone who looks like a dead fish? There's no pleasure in that. I took another bite of the steak. It really was very good, and so was the wine. I used the time to calm myself down, but make Karen and Darren even more anxious. Next, the expenses, so I assume you're paying for all of this? Of course, Darren replied. I know how many times you've stayed here at her place because you've used the same credit card and a company credit card at that. I looked at Karen and said, that's a fabulous dress, and I bet you have equally fabulous lingerie underneath. It's not like anything I've ever seen. You've never worn something like that for me. Where did it come from? She bowed her head, slowly lifted it up, looked at me and said, Darren brought it. He said it would fit me. That was great. At least he had an eye for it. So who do you think paid for all those dinners, dates, and sexy clothes, him or the company? I suggest that when you come in on Monday, you analyze his expenses as carefully as you analyzed mine, and anything that isn't strictly company business you report to upper management. One question I have to ask is why are you here at this hotel? Karen replied, I saw it as revenge for doing it at the hotel where you cheated on me. But I called to inform Darren of the change of plan and I was moving on to my next slot. Karen's face went pale and she looked at Darren and said, You really are a stupid bastard. He told you where he was going and you brought me here anyway. You really are an arrogant pig, thinking only of yourself, aren't you? No, I just got a message that he was leaving. The office didn't hear it properly. They thought he was going to line him from Warminster, not the other way round. But if that had been the case, we'd still be here at the same time as him, you stupid bastard. Karen spat back at Darren. But he didn't follow the plan I gave him. I let them argue as I finished my steak and thought it was time to finish it. Okay, let's summarize. First, you used my loyalty to the company and the client to get me to do something I didn't want to do. You made me leave the house three nights a week and worked so hard that on Friday I was so exhausted that all I wanted to do was sleep. You lied to me about Lynam's replacement. You didn't even advertise for a replacement. I continued, you drugged and then took compromising photos of my wife to use to blackmail her into demanding more sex. You fabricated evidence to convince my wife that I was cheating on her. You used company funds to pay for your nights out and gifts for her. I think that's misappropriation of company funds. I wonder what your boss, Sheila, has to say about that. You did all this to screw my wife? Of course I did. He nodded his head softly. Karen looked at me, furrowing her eyebrows. You said it was Sheila's company. A minute ago, you said upper management. What do you mean, upper management? I thought Darren was the boss. It's his company. He's top management. I shook my head. No, it's Sheila's company. She owns it. Her father started it, and he left a clause that the dumbass here shouldn't own any part of it. He's the director, but it's not his company. But she never comes. We only see her five or six times a year. Well, even though he's an evil, cheating, shaggy bastard, he seems to be able to run this company and do a good job. She doesn't have to walk, but I bet she'd be interested in him using company money to screw the administrative staff. I'd never seen Karen's face so red with anger. She held out her hand to me and said, give me the key card to your room. Don't argue, just give it to me. I had rarely seen her so angry, and I wasn't going to argue. I gave her the key card. I can book another room later if I need it. She whirled out of the restaurant. I picked up the steak knife and started playing with it and said to Darren, now here's what you're going to do, or I'm going to tell Sheila what you two are up to. Tomorrow morning, you're going to call Sheila and tell her I'm sick. And since you're going to be in the area, you're going to pick up my workout. I'm going to take the night off to see if I can stay married. When you get home tomorrow night, you're going to tell Sheila that you've forgotten how enjoyable the training was and that you want to do it more. To that end, every two weeks, you will pick up my workout schedule. Yes, I know there is a problem with continuity of training, but they will work out. You will then explain to Sheila that I will do your work while you do yours. That way, you have a succession plan in case something happens to you or Sheila, like you want to take an extended vacation or get into a serious accident. 
he didn't miss the threat in my voice. You have someone who can step in, someone who understands and can run the business for a short time. I continued. Do you think you can do that? I think yes, it actually makes sense. But how can I trust you? How can I be sure you won't tell Sheila about this? No, you're going to have to trust me. Do you think if she lets me and Karen stay, we'll both be out of work, or at least out of Karen's job? And we both love our jobs, and I can't afford to start looking for a new job right now. I poured myself another glass from a 30-pound bottle of wine. This bottle of wine was more than my daily expenses. I just looked at it. Well, he smiled slightly and said, Yes, I think I can do that. It does make sense. She might believe it. I didn't like his little smile that was about to wipe away. Just because we like our jobs doesn't mean we won't turn you over to your wife, even if it means we lose our jobs. If we lost our jobs, it would be fun to go for unfair dismissal. That would shut you down. Then you'll write a letter to Sheila explaining everything you've done, including wasting company funds. Then, to cover your ass, I'm going to add a little bit explaining why I didn't stick you in her. I like her. She's been a good friend of mine for years. I liked you too. I don't want her to suffer anymore, so you'll be faithful and I'll keep the letter as blackmail. Just then, Karen returned. She walked a little slower, but not by much. She had completely changed her clothes. She sat down next to me and said, It's better I was starting to feel a bit dirty in these clothes. I threw it away. Oh, and Darren, I wouldn't let Sheila unpack your suitcase. There might be some surprises in there. I think I've lost a couple pairs of panties. He wasn't smiling now. I continued. Oh, and finally, you'll stop hanging around and stay true to Sheila, because if I see you hanging around, I don't need to bring it up. I can just tell her what you're doing there and then. He lifted his head slightly and shook it. I won't write the letter. I'll do the rest. I could understand that. Giving someone power over you isn't easy. I picked up the phone. That's when I wrote it all down and it went straight to Sheila. He held up his hands. No, stop. I'll do it. The letter wouldn't hold up in court. It didn't have to. Only in Sheila's court. I bent over the table and said with a sarcastic snarl, Right now, the boss is going to back off and write the letter. Her, pointing a thumb in Karen's direction. She should try to save her marriage. She grabbed my hand, looking at me. There's a chance. Can we do this, really? There was no entrance to hell when I walked in here, but after listening to the two of you and what that conniving bastard did, there might be. But I want to know how you had the conscience to trick me with him, I said, pointing at Darren. At that moment, he got up and walked away. I thought about it as I went to change, and I think I have some kind of answer. Revenge, arousal, no sex, four days a week. I've been thinking about it. I haven't actually finished thinking about it yet, so some of it will come out confusing, and some of it I've already worked through. But it's all jumbled up in my head. It's not going to come out in the right order. First of all, I'm really, really sorry. I'm sorry I cheated on you. I'm sorry I hurt you, and I'm sorry we're here now. While Darren cheated on me, I have to take some of the blame. I'm sorry, darling, some of this you won't like, but it was never your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. I don't know where to begin. Let's just say revenge. When I saw you with that pretty young secretary entering your room at that time of night, one thing occurred to me. You were having an affair while you were away. I just remembered it, but when he showed me the picture, he made allusions to, why is that pretty secretary coming into your husband's room at this time of night? And I wonder what they might be up to. And I wonder what they might be up to. I'm sure it's perfectly innocent and nothing is going on. I realize now that he was very sneaky and was putting doubts and thoughts in my head. It didn't help. But you're here every week and when you come home on Friday, you're too tired to make me happy. Now I know it was all made up. I opened my mouth to ask why she didn't confront me, but she quickly leaned over and kissed me, silencing me. Please let me finish, darling. The next thing I assume is why I continued after I found out he drugged me, and then blackmailed me. I should have come straight to you. I was worried about our jobs and paying for uni for the baby. That's no excuse. It's what I should have done, but I didn't. And for that, I'm sorry. It was a mistake. I'm sorry, darling. It can be a bit painful. 
It's painful for me, so I'm not sure how bad it will be for you. I missed sex. It was only once a month, but it seemed to take the edge off so I could be ready for you. I know that's a really pathetic excuse, but it's all I got. And there was excitement. It was a little exciting to do it in a hotel where I thought you cheated on me. Again, now I know you didn't cheat. Makes me feel really shitty. I just opened my mouth again, but she put a finger to my lips and continued. I don't need your sympathy. By my gullibility and stupidity, I brought this on myself. The gifts and presents meant nothing. I never used our things with him or what he brought me with you. She looked down. I never did anything with him that wasn't for you. In fact, we only had normal sex. It wasn't very good. She was quiet, taking a sip of wine. While I was thinking about it, I came up with a reason why I can do this. I'll have to explain later. I'll admit that I'm a little lonely, and it's nice to be around someone you know and that you were their friend, which probably just makes it worse. I cheated on you with a friend. Oh, the dinners were good. He's good company. His jokes aren't too bad. And there was also revenge. And that was kind of exciting. She smiled slightly at me. But he's shit in bed. He turns me on, but there's no high. I don't feel completely satisfied. Just, I think he used to buy me clothes that helped me store them in separate boxes. How could I have done that? We may have to check this with a psychologist, but I think I put everything in little boxes. One box was my work life, by the way. Nothing happened there. The big box was my life with you, and the very small box was my cheating with him. I think mentally I separated them all when I was with him. The other two I didn't see, so they didn't matter. When I was with you, the work box was ajar and his was tightly closed. Like there was no cheating. I could have blacked out. I can't explain it any other way. I'm so sorry, honey. I felt bad about cheating on Sheila. But I used the excuse that I was protecting her by keeping it to myself. Another little box, I guess. She took a mouthful of wine. I'm sorry, darling. I seem to talk a lot, and for quite a while. How can I make it up to you? Can we work this out? I do love you. Could you please forgive me? I know it will be hard to forget, but I will do everything in my power to help you forget. I'll do anything. Can we go up to your room so I can start making peace with you? After what I've heard, I've already decided to forgive you. But you're right. Forgetting will be hard. Yes, we can go up to my room, but there's no way in hell I'm sleeping with you after where that asshole was. It'll just be for sleeping, and I'll let you know when I'm ready. Once again, a slight smile appeared on her face. Oh, honey, we were so late because of your phone call. We didn't have time for all this. The last time he was with me was over a month ago. You're the last person I made love to. It probably doesn't matter. But even when we did, even though I didn't need to, I made him wear a condom. And there were no kisses on the lips, just the cheek. I thought to myself that there were some things I could have done better. I should have confronted him when he told me to go out to the north of the plains. I should have inquired about recruiting. Still, she was right. Most of the blame was on her, but mostly on him. I told her that I had made arrangements with Darren to keep her from telling Sheila about it, and that I'd be home all week every other week until we found a replacement, and that I'll be in the office with her during that week so we may have to catch up. That should make her a little happy. I stood up and held out my hand to her. Okay, let's go find a way to make it up to her. It was three weeks later when Karen and I walked into the office. A little late because we had been a little naughty. All of our co-workers were gathered around someone's laptop, some of them stunned and some of them giggling. When we walked in, there was dead silence and there were a few confused looks. Okay, what's so funny now silence and confused expressions on your faces, I said. Come on, come on. John, one of the oldest members of the team, said, We found something on YouTube that, uh, looks like you and Darren talking in a restaurant. It looks a little bit serious. It's one of four, and we're only halfway through the first one. I think we'd better not look at the others. At this point, Karen spoke up. We can't tell you what to do. I'd be embarrassed because I screwed up, and you'd find out what happened and why Darren is only here every other week. But I'm begging you, please don't tell Sheila about this. Don't tell Sheila what? Shit. She was standing right behind us. Oh, shit! Karen and I said it at the same time. Sheila rushed over to the laptop and spun it around. 
From where we were, it was clear that the video was titled Husband Confronts Wife and Lover in Restaurant, and the picture was clearly Darren. And if you looked closely, you could make out my face. There was steam coming out of Sheila's ears. Looking at us, he said, You two are in my fucking office right now. She rushed away. Karen and I followed her. I walked past my desk and grabbed a few things. I had expected this at some point, just not so soon. I promised I wouldn't tell Sheila about it. But I wonder who sent John the link to the video. Sheila got angry, very angry. That's right, you two, what the hell is going on? Before I could open my mouth, Karen stepped forward and said, Sheila, I'm really, really sorry I screwed up. She looked down at the floor and continued. I had sex with Darren. Sheila leaned back in her chair. Not again, and you, I never thought you'd risk it. Looking at me, she said, John, you knew about this. I thought we were friends. Why didn't you tell me about it? It was my turn to step forward. Sheila, I'm sorry. Karen was tricked. I'm afraid to say that Darren found out that Karen was going through menopause and had an increased libido. He tricked her into thinking I was having an affair after making me spend three nights a week at work and being so tired on a Friday that it was pretty useless. He drugged Karen and took compromising photos and then blackmailed her. He took the pictures at that driving simulator convention, the one you couldn't go to because you were sick. Most of the fight seemed to go beyond Sheila, so I took the opportunity to sit down and put Darren's letter, flash drive, and my recorder on the table in front of her. Karen sat down as well. Sheila, it's because you're a friend that we didn't know what to do. Do we tell you the truth and destroy your marriage, or do we cover it up so you don't find out? You seem to be happily married. I asked Darren to write down exactly what he did to Karen to get her to cheat on me. He signed it. Then Karen and I explained the reasons why we didn't tell you about it. Karen wanted to tell you that she didn't. I know what pain is, and I didn't want to put you through that. We didn't know he'd done this before. We thought it was an isolated incident. I threatened Darren that if he cheated on you again, I would tell you about it. Here is the audio and video of that encounter that you saw on YouTube. I assume you were the one who got him to go back to teaching? Yes, I wanted to spend some time at home to give us time to sort out our marriage. I have the whole story now. I've forgiven Karen, basically. Karen threw a frown at me, very upset by the mostly comment. You two better get out of here. I have some things to think about. We left. Karen stayed his for about half an hour and then brought coffee to Sheila. She knocked gently on the door when she got no answer, opened it quietly and peered into Sheila's office. She quickly disappeared inside. Some unpleasant thoughts crashed into my head. I rushed into the office and saw Karen hugging Sheila, who was crying. Karen waved her hand at me, and the three of us hugged. After two or three minutes, Sheila seemed to shake it off, pushed us away, and said, Thank you, I needed that. Looking at both of us, she said, I just finished reading and listening to what you left me. Now I have more to think about, so back off again. I squeezed her hand lightly and said, We're sorry, Sheila. Then we left. As soon as we got to the door, Sheila said, Thanks for the coffee, Karen. I appreciate it. I may need another one in 20 minutes. It sounded like forgiveness, or at least an olive branch for what she had done. For the rest of the day, the office was very quiet. Suddenly, Darren burst through the door and quickly made his way to my desk. I saw what was about to happen. I stood up with both hands in the air and said, I didn't tell her. Blame Mr. Influencer and YouTube. He turned away and headed straight for Sheila's office. He didn't knock, but walked straight in, closing the door behind him if that was possible. The office got quieter. Ten seconds later, there was a pop so loud it was like a sonic boom. These walls are very thin. You cheating, lying bastard. With one of our employees, with our friends, you humiliated me. You're fired. You couldn't help but notice Sheila's tone. You can't fire me for that. No, I'm firing you for misappropriating company funds. I, uh, but I love you. It was just a little fun. It didn't mean anything. Sheila got even louder. What? You're risking our marriage and your job for just a little fun and our friend's marriage. You do realize that Karen can hear you. There was another slap, almost as loud as the first one. And that's for Karen because she's too good a person to do that to you. 
She obviously didn't realize that Karen had done exactly that, though probably not as much. The yelling stopped, but there was obviously a lot of talking, and it seemed one-sided. If she had just fired Darren, we would have lost three instructors. That wouldn't have been fun. After about half an hour, Sheila left the office and Darren followed. She pointed to Cyril's old desk and said to Darren, sit down and shut up. She looked around the room. Okay, you know what happened? There are going to be some changes. First, Darren was fired, but we can't afford to lose that many instructors, so I've rehired him as an instructor at a base salary. If he doesn't like it, he can leave. But he knows that if he leaves the company, he's leaving the family home. John is going to take over all of Darren's responsibilities, except for his directorship, and that may change later. I'm not sure it's the right decision, but for now, it will have to do. Karen, every day Darren will bring you the SD card from his tracker and video recorder. I would appreciate it if you would do a spot check to make sure he is where he is supposed to be. If you have any doubt that it isn't, you should let me know immediately. And could you cancel all hotel contracts? He's going to be coming home daily. John, you know the area. Work out a schedule so he doesn't get too tired. Karen, you won't need to check his expenses. I've cleared them. He'll have to pay for everything out of his own pocket until he recoups what he stole from the company. He'll give you all his receipts, and you keep track of his expenses, please. Darren was now looking down at the dump utterly humiliated and under the thumb of his wife. I realized that divorce was still on the table. As much as I wanted to retaliate physically, I also didn't want to find myself in the role of another instructor and risk losing my contract with the army. I am a patient person. Now I wasn't traveling as much anymore. Karen wanted to make it up to me, I didn't mind. But now we had time for the excitement she wanted. I caused her the excitement that the stationery store could attest to. At times, we may have gone too far. We have been asked to leave the department store in town. Who would have thought there would be video surveillance in the changing rooms, an invasion of privacy? A loud, authoritative voice said, Please open the door. We know what you're doing in there. I mentioned this to the guard as we were leaving. We don't know. Can we just say your wife is not very quiet? As he opened the front door of the store for us, he whispered to me, Good day, buddy. While that voice may have deflated my working body parts and damaged my libido, it did the opposite for Karen. We headed to the nearest park and managed to find a secluded spot to finish up. We found a grove where we couldn't be seen. I wasn't going to get caught for indecent exposure, so I turned her around and turned her to face me.